Hey guys, welcome to BP, the Bible Perspective. The rapture. And let's talk about who are the saints in Revelation. Now, before we do, please like and share this video and subscribe to BP, the Bible Perspective. As always, if you have a thought or comment, add it to the comment section below. All comments are welcome. This is video 30 of our deep dive into the subject of eschatology. Uh, which is the study of end times with the focus on the rapture. That's basically what we're doing this deep dive, in-depth study on. Now, let me define the terms again. So when I talk about eschatology, we're talking about, again, the study of end times. We're talking about the rapture. We're talking about the event when Jesus is going to come and remove his church, his body, from the earth. That centers around the tribulation period, or what is also known as the great tribulation period. Now, some of the comments, too, that I have, let me make something clear when we talk about the great tribulation. Because some people try to kind of parse words, <clears throat> okay? When we talk about the great tribulation, we're talking about a period of time generally referred to as the seven-year tribulation period, or the day of the Lord, when Jesus is going to unleash God's judgment on the ungodly. Now, there's some people who say that there is no such thing as a great tribulation. And they would kind of try to split hairs over the, the term the, and then say great tribulation. Well, depending on the translation, that you use. So if you're reading from the King James, and the old King James is that, it'll just say tribulation or great tribulation. More modern translations, including the new King James, will use the phrase the great tribulation. Now, I think it's sort of a silly way to part hairs because the great tribulation or great tribulation that Jesus referred to in Matthew 24 is spelled out in the book of Revelation, especially from chapters 6 to 19. Now, when it comes to the rapture, because this is what really this study was birthed from, I think the original title was Biblical Proofs for the Rapture. Um, and so, and then I just started just tag it, numbering them. And now we're on video 30. The debate mostly when it comes to the rapture of the church, the debate really is around when the rapture will occur. And it occurs somewhere around the great tribulation period. Now there are three commonly held views about the rapture. There is what's called the pre-tribulation view, which I hold to which I am making my defense in these 30 videos that I believe that Jesus is going to remove his church, rapture his church, catch up his church before the tribulation period begins. There are those who hold to what's called a mid-tribulation rapture view. They believe that the church would be raptured in the middle of the tribulation period. And then there are those who hold to a post-tribulation view, which means that the church will not be raptured until the end of the tribulation period. In fact, they believe that the rapture of the church and the second coming will happen at the same time. Okay, I'm refuting that. <coughs> but let me also say this. In my, in my acknowledgement, None of the views can produce a plain stated verse as to when the rapture will happen. In other words, the Bible doesn't say it. So even with my view as to pre-tribulation, the Bible does not say that the church would be raptured. It doesn't plainly say, I should say, that the church would be raptured before the tribulation period begins. I hold that view because of other verses or what I would like to call scriptural circumstantial evidence. 
but there's not a plainly stated verses. So for that reason, I'm not dogmatic on my position. Whereas I could certainly be changed if a person shows me and present an argument uh, as I am present, excuse me, as I am presenting the argument for my view. All right. But none of the none of the positions hold to that. So what I am encouraging is let's have a godly discussion and even a godly disagreement. In other words, I'm convinced I'm certainly not going to persuade most post-tribulation people, those who hold to the post-rapture position. And that's fine because unless I was able to say, here is the verse that says that the rapture is going to happen before the tribulation period, I cannot be so dogmatic about it. So I'm acknowledging that. However, let me say again, I hold firmly to my position at, that the church would be raptured before the tribulation period began. And I think I've been making a good case, and I acknowledge again that there are those who would disagree with me. Now, um, in the title, as you can see, I am dealing with who are the saints in the book of Revelation. It seems to me one of the problems of people identifying groups of people, and I'm going to say especially my mid-tribulation and my post-tribulation brothers, that they say, well, the word saints, as it is used in the book of Revelations, applies to the church of Jesus Christ. I'm going to get into that more. But what I want to say is that it is important to understand when the Bible defines something or describes something, we should pay attention to the details. And that's where, if you say that the, the word saints is referring to the church or the body of Christ in the book of Revelation, you're not paying attention to the details. So that's why I want to go back. Let me bring up, share my screen here. And I want to, um, before I do that, I want to make a couple of comparisons. Uh, and again, by way of definition, by way of description. So back in Matthew 24, which has been sort of our foundational spring off study. So Jesus, after predicting the destruction of the temple. They asked him in verse 3, when will these things happen? What is the sign of your coming? And then he says of the end of the age. <clears throat> From verses then 4 to 14, I believe he refers to then the church age or what happens to believers. And then he switches thought when we get to verses 15. And then he begins to zero in on Israel <clears throat> when he talks about the abomination that causes desolation. Now, for, without a doubt, Daniel's 70 weeks. Now look at verse 15 again. So when you see the abomination that causes desolation, verse 15, spoken by Daniel the prophet. So without a doubt, when you go back and you read that, and we read that many times in this study, the 70 weeks specifically says it is for your people, meaning Israel. And then it says your city, meaning Jerusalem. And then it says the holy place, meaning the temple. That's what the 70 weeks for. So when Jesus refers to the abomination that caused desolation, he's talking about the prophecy that refers to Israel. So in the Old Testament, we see prophecy after prophecy after prophecy concerning Israel's restoration. 
Now that's important because when we come down then to, let's look at verse 15 again. So when you see the abomination it calls desolation, spoken by the prophet Daniel, standing in the holy place, then he says, let the reader understand. Then he says, then those in Judea. Now, if he was talking about the church, why would he then focus on one geographical location, such as Judea, if he's talking to the church? If, this, if the group is universal, we can even say Catholic, <laughs> okay? If the group is universal, meaning all believers, then why is he then centering on Judea? Well, the answer is that he's not. If you go back and you read, well, let me do that. Uh, let me go back to Daniel. Just to, again, I want to, for continuity's sake, uh, and for those who are just, I don't have a big, large channel, so I get new view, viewers. So just for continuity's sake. I'm just going to read Daniel's 70 weeks. Now, if you go back in some of the other chapters, again, the other studies, uh, we have looked at this verse many, many times. Okay. So verse 24, he says 70 weeks. Now, to so again, remember, Daniel was reading the prophecy of Jeremiah when he came across the prophecy that Israel would be exiled for 70 years. They'd be out of their land for 70 years. He's reading that, and then he says, well, 70 years are almost up. And then he begins to pray. God sends the angel Gabriel to give him this revelation, among other things, right? So in verse 24, he says, this is the angel then speaking to Daniel, when he says, 70 weeks are decreed about your people and your holy city to bring the rebellion to an end, to put a stop to sin, to wipe away iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up the prophecy and to anoint the most holy place. So again, this prophecy is about Israel. And then he goes on and says, know and understand this, from the issuing of the decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem. It says, until Messiah the Prince will be seven weeks and 62 weeks. It will be rebuilt with the plan and the moat, but in difficult times. Now, to kind of go back, he said, from the issuing of the decree, this happened in um, um, the book of Ezra. So let me do that. Let me go to the book of Ezra. Now, the reason why I am taking the time to go over these in detail is because one of the problems that I find is that people, when they have their theological positions, that they're not citing these verses, they're not going, they're not paying attention to the details. And so that's why I said, even though and the detail, there is no scripture that says that the church would be raptured before the tribulation period. I must concede that I can't be dogmatic on that. I'm a, so, however, there is no verse that plainly states when the church is going to be raptured. In other words, there is no plainly stated verse. Now, we know that Jesus, when he comes, he's coming on the cloud, every eye will see him. We that is plainly stated. Don't have to debate. If you say Jesus is not coming, you are a false prophet. By the way, there are, have been many, many people who have said, "Hey, I'm the Messiah." They kind of walked in the door, right? I'm the Messiah right away. False prophet. Uh, but, um, I'm going to read this again because, um, let 
this is important that we, again, pay attention to the details. So verse chapter one, verse one says, now this is, uh, uh, this was after the 70 years. So you saw Daniel in chapter nine, reading about this event. Uh, this is a few years after when Daniel received his prophecy. So he says, in the first year of King Cyrus the Persia, the word of the Lord spoken through Jeremiah was fulfilled. The Lord put it in the mind of King of Cyrus to issue a proclamation throughout his entire kingdom and to put it in writing. This is what the King Cyrus of Persia says. The Lord of God, I mean, the Lord, the God of heaven has given me all kingdoms of the earth and has appointed me to build him a house at Jerusalem and Judea. So now right here, no, verse three, whoever among his people, may his God be with him. May he go to Jerusalem in Judea, in Judah, and build the house of the Lord, the God of Israel. The God who is in Jerusalem, uh, the God of Jerusalem, let every survivor, wherever he lives, be assisted by the men of the region with silver, gold, uh, and livestock, along with the free will offerings for the house of God in Jerusalem. Now, again, notice this prophecy is fulfilled, the issuing of the decree. Now, when, when Ezra issues this, remember it started a prophetic timeline, a prophetic clock. This is what he means here. So, he says, no one understands this from the issuing of the decree to restore and build Jerusalem. So right here, that's when this now 70-week prophecy begins. And by the way, the, the term 70 weeks, he says 70 weeks are decreed. So a week here was a seven-year period of time. So when he says 70 weeks, it is 70 sets of seven or 70 sets uh, of seven-year period of times totaling 490 years. All right. So he says, 70 weeks of decree. Then he says, no one understand this, that from the issuing of the decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince will be seven weeks and 62 weeks. Or guess what? 69 weeks. So watch this. Un uh, until Messiah the Prince, 69 weeks. Verse 26, after those 62 weeks, the Messiah will be cut off and will have nothing. So after 62 weeks, no, so so right at this point, we know that this brings us right up to Jesus, the Messiah. Then he goes on and says, the people of the coming prince will, will destroy the city and the sanctuary. The end will come with the flood, and to the end there will be wars, desolation of decree. Then he will make a firm covenant with many for one week, so a seven-year period of time. But in the middle of the week, he will put a stop to the sacrifice and offerings, and the abomination of desolation will be on the ring of the temple until the decree destruction is poured out on the desolator. Now, the abomination that makes desolation. Let's go back to Matthew, because did he not just, did he not just, uh, oh, come on, uh, tell us, so we're, we're comparing, we can do this side by side, and, uh, oh, I didn't mean to do that. All right. So when he says here, back in verse 15, so when you see the abomination, it calls desolation, spoken by Daniel the prophet. Well, here it is, right? 70 weeks are decreed upon your people. And then he says, uh, he will make a firm covenant with, with many for one week, but in the middle of the week, he put a stop to offering and the abomination of desolation. So this is the period that Jesus is talking about. This is the time frame. So now we can ask the question, when will this happen? Well, he goes on and says, 
Then in those days, then, okay, then, um, then those in Judea will flee for the mountains. Now, remember, he's talking about Israel doing this period of time. What is the focus of the prophecy? Israel doing this time. Watch. A man on the housetop must not come down and get his things out of the house. A man in the field must not go back to get his clothes. Woe to the women. Woe to the pregnant women and nursing mothers in those days. Pray that your escape may not be in the winter or on the Sabbath. But then there will be great tribulation, the kind that hasn't seen taking place from the beginning of the world until now and never will again. Unless those days were limited, no one would survive, but those days will be limited because of the elect. So during this period of time would be called the Great Tribulation, the seven-year period of time. Israel will be suffering. However, as we get into other scripture, other things will be happening during this period of time as well. So now let's kind of go back to verse 14. And he says, this good news of the kingdom will be proclaimed in all the world as the testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. Now, we studied this again. It's important to understand description. Is this referring to the church? Now, I said this because, um, remember in Acts chapter 1, let's read this. Notice what they asked him in verse 7, verse 6. So when they had come together, now remember this is just moments from Jesus ascending into heaven. He says, so when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, are you restoring the kingdom to Israel at this time? Now, why is this a valid question? Because as they are students, who studying Old Testament prophecy, they have read of the prophecies of the Messiah. They have read of the restoration of Israel. So even though Israel will be destroyed, it is also going to be restored. Jeremiah 31, to be exact, one of the verses. There are many, many, many verses, right? Uh, Ezekiel, the valley of the dry bones. Right, that that is it's referring to Israel. He says that he says these dry bones that came to life. He says it is the whole house of Israel. So then, are you restoring the kingdom? Now they're asking this. These are his disciples, his apostles, right? That he said, <laughs> go into all the world and preach the gospel. Then remember in, in, in chapter 24, this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all of the world, and then the end will come. So now they're asking, well, what about Israel? Will you restore the kingdom to Israel at this time? So then he says, um, verse 7, this is his answer. He said to them, it is not for you to know the times or the periods that the Father has set by his own authority. But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, and into the ends of the earth. So now we can ask the question, what happens at the ends of the earth? Hold that thought. I want to read one more verse of scripture before we get to the book of Revelation, because I want to talk about the saints. But I, again, I think it's important that we understand uh that we understand um the details so we know can identify who he's talking to what time frame what group uh this is ephesians chapter 1 verse 2 says and he has put everything under his feet and appointed him as head over everything for the church which is his body i just want to establish that the church is his body scripturally, we're talking about the church. We're not talking about a 501c3 institution. We're not talking about a denomination. We're not talking about an institution. The church is his body. So in chapter 2 and then verse uh, 18, he says, well, 
Let me, go, let me read verse 17, because remember, what did he tell them? When they asked, are you restoring the kingdom at this time? Now, remember that question. Are you restoring the kingdom at this time? He says, don't you worry about the times and the periods the fathers put in his uh, authority. In other words, don't worry about the time that is that God has for Israel, the time and the period. You will receive power after you receive the Holy Spirit, and you'll be witnesses, my witnesses, right, in Jerusalem and unto the end of the earth. Now, so what is the result of our being a witness during this time? So he says, verse 17, when the Messiah came, he proclaimed the good news of peace. Now that's important right here. He proclaimed the good news of peace to you who were far away and peace to those that were near. Now, of course, in the context of the chapter here, he is referring to the Jew and the Gentile. Now that's important, the Jew and the Gentiles. In fact, let me go back. Again, this is important. I'm going to start reading in verse 11 because I want to identify this. What, I, what I'm doing is I'm identifying what and who the who is. And then also the time. Now, remember he said, when they asked him, are you restoring the kingdom of Israel at this time, right? Um, and I'm saying... Oh, here it is. Uh, verse 7 again. Uh, it says, verse 6, Lord, are you restoring the kingdom of it to Israel at this time? Right? Don't worry about that. This is what you were about, being a witness, right? But notice he said, at this time. So during the church age, God is not restoring the kingdom of Israel. Okay? So what is God doing? So then in verse 11, he says here, so remember that at one time you were Gentiles in the flesh called uncircumcised by those called the circumcised, which is done in the flesh by human hands. At that time, you were without the Messiah, excluded from the citizenship of Israel. But we got a better, we got a better covenant. I just wanted to say that. But notice the Gentiles he's referring to were excluded from the citizenship of Israel, foreigners to the covenant of promise, without hope and without God in the world. Now he's referring to the Gentiles, non-Jew, the non-Jew, which I'm a non-Jew. Verse 13, but now in Christ Jesus, you who were far away have been brought near by the blood of the Messiah. For he is our peace, who made both groups one, and tore down the dividing wall of hostility in his flesh. He made of no effect the law consisting of commandments and express in regulation so that he might create, now get this, he might create in himself one new man from the two resulting in peace. Now notice this, he might create one new, from Jew and Gentile, he's creating. Now, when is he doing this? Understand that question. When is he doing this? So he said he might um, create one new man from the two resulting in peace. Verse 16, he did this so that he might reconcile both to God in one body through the cross and put the hostility to death by it, meaning the hostility between the Jew and the Gentiles. By the way, at this point, the, the, the Jews had a problem with the Gentiles. <coughs> they always kind of kept themselves separate. But notice he says right here, they were, God created one new man. Verse 17, when the Messiah came, he proclaimed, we could say preached, right? He proclaimed, the good news of peace to you who were far away 
and peace to those who were near. So both Jew and Gentile, Jesus proclaimed the good news of peace. Why? Because both were estranged from God. So then he says, verse 18, for, for through him, we both have access by one spirit to the Father. So you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizenship with the saints and members of God's household. Very important here. See, remember, he's, he still has some building he's going to do, right? He's, he's going to restore the kingdom of Israel. We're going to get to that in a moment. We're going to see this. And then he says, verse 20, we'll build on the foundation. Built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the cornerstone. Now get this, verse 21. The whole building being put together by him. Now, remember, I asked the question, what is God doing now? When he sent us out to be a witness, so what is he doing? We, we are a witness proclaiming the good news of peace. And as this is happening, God is, we are being, the whole building that he is building, right, is being put together by him. And then he says, grows into a holy sanctuary in the Lord. And then verse 22, you also are being, that's the present tense, put together. This is not a future event. Right now, as we speak, we are being put together for God's dwelling in the spirit. See, so right now what God is doing is building his house. So my question is, when we talk about the difference between the saints going through the tribulation period, and I always ask the question, why? It is God building his house during the tribulation period, right? It, 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 so at the same time that he is afflicting the earth, is he building, is he continuing now to build his dwelling in the spirit? See, that's why I said I, 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 we need to understand the details here. Now, one other detail I want to um, put together show as in Galatians. Hmm. Uh, Galatians chapter 3, no, chapter 4, Galatians chapter 4, now I want you to under, read this, and then we're going to go to the book of Revelations, I'm going to go through those different groups in the book of Revelations, and let's see if in the book of, Re in the book of Revelation that this is a description of these group of people. Now, um, I'll pick up verse 4 says, When the time came to completion, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law so that we might receive adoptions as sons and because you and because you are sons now notice that sons god has sent god has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts crying our father now this term abba father is a term of endurement so much like we would say daddy Papa, and, and only your children can call you that. Now, now understand that only your children can call you that. Um, 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 th that those terms, um, you know, daddy, dad, 
Papa, right? That, that that's a close term indicating um that the, 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 the close relationship, the bond that we have of father and child, parent and child. We cry Abba Father. Verse 7, so you're no longer a slave. I want you to follow that. But a son, and then he said, and if a son, then an heir through Christ. Now, one of the things, and I'm going to go down to the book of Revelation. One of the things, though, but that I never, ever hear my post-tribulation brothers talk about is this verse. A verse in verses like this, but this verse. Um, and that they focus, which is amazing to me, that they focus more on our, that they, they, they seem to be more preoccupied that we suffer in the, um, the tribulation under this great affliction than anything else. Okay. So, so part of our debate, you could say. Is of course now when we get to the book of Revelations as we are here, what groups, who are the saints? Now the first thing is the word saint is applied in a broad way. So the assumption is that, well, first of all, let, let, let's define the word saint is a person who's set apart. Now that that's basically all the word means. It means a person who is set apart. It is the same as saying saint or sanctify, sanctification. Um, believe it or not, so a lot of these words were Greek words that were used during pagan times. So, for example, um, pagans used the same word. So they would say that temple is a building that is uh, sanctified, right? Sanctified but it was dedicated, set apart for the exclusive use of that, whatever pagan god it is. Now, everything in the building was also sanctified. The chairs, the benches, the altars, right? They, uh, the utensils, they were, you, you would never use them for any other use other than for the worship of the, the pagan gods. Well, Christians, of course, use the word to refer to themselves, to, to God. God is being holy. God is now, now the word holy itself doesn't in and of itself means purity, but you're pure because if it's attached to God, it has to be pure. Okay, so so understand that. So when we're talking about when God says be holy, or when God says holiness, the idea is that we are to live our lives, we are to be separated in a holy, pure way to God. In other words, you, just could, you can't just kind of throw anything up to God. That's what he means here. So holy. So the word saint is a person that is separated unto God. Now, you, you think about the verses that we have read, that we have been separated <clears throat> as sons, heirs. <clears throat> we are being built together. That is separation. So God is separating us from the world, from sin, <clears throat> and everything in it, right? We are separated unto God. So that's all what the word saint means. Now, the word saint, especially our English translation word, is used both in the Old Testament and then in the New Testament. So you see in the Old Testament, that refers to Israel. Israel were set apart for God's use. They were a nation that was set apart from all of the pagan nations around them. Paul used the word concerning the church, okay, exclusive, I mean, extensively, extensively, right? Why? Because, for example, take Corinthians. Corinthians was known for its debauchery, known for its immorality, to the point where People would say you are Corinthianized. That means you, you're you're the debauchery, the moral, and so you. If you read the 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 um, uh, the letter to the Corinthians, 
you, you see the word saint used frequently by Paul because what? You're separated from the pagan lifestyle of the Corinthians or uh, the pagans or the unsaved. So then when we get to the book of Revelations here, we're going to see the word saint. So the, again, the point is the word saint is not exclusively meaning only the church of Jesus Christ. And that's the point. Now, what I want to do is um, I want to, if you think about the word saint churches here, and this is kind of, look at, this is Revelation chapter one. And then I want you to see something verse in, in um, Reve Revelation chapter one. And I'm going to pick up a verse 11 because I'm going to kind of scroll through these verses. I'm contemplating now doing a quick study through the entire book of Revelations as it uh, applies to this. Again, so that we can get a full picture of this. But anyway, verse 11 says, um, saying, write on the scroll. So you're talking about Jesus is saying this. Write on the scroll what you see and send it to the seven churches. Ephesus, Sir, uh, Smyrga, uh, Perg uh, Pergamum. Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. So the church here, remember in Ephesians chapter 1, and by the way, the, it, these are all seven churches that were, again, existing towards the end of the first century. And um, 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 he's so he's writing to a group. So the seven churches of Ephesus, a group. However, notice the word church. Now, remember we said that the word church in Ephesians chapter 1 is his body. The church is his body. So he is speaking to a group of people that are his body. So that's when you see these in chapter 2, the seven churches, the message to each of the church. And then what is interesting is we come to the end of chapter 3. And in chapter 4... We no longer see the word church used until the end of Revelation. Now, the reason why is because, remember, Revelation is written to these churches. He starts off by the, the rebuke of the seven churches. Well, six of them at least, or five, I should say five. At least five of the seven churches have severe rebuke. But after this, from chapters four on down to the, until the end, the word church is never used. Now, remember the word church referred to his body. But notice this, and it says, verse 4 says, After this I looked, and there in heaven a door was an open door. And the first voice that I heard speaking to me like a trumpet said, Come up here, and I will show you what must take place after this. Now, the word come up here, some people translate this or apply this as the rapture. Let me just say this. I do not see the rapture in this at all, period. At all, okay. Um, remember, so let's keep it always in context. Th th this is not describing the rapture, okay. Now, one reason why we know that it's not the rapture is because remember the rapture, as it told, as Paul taught it in First Thessalonians, Jesus comes back to us. I mean, he comes for us, not back. He comes, he comes, he descends with the shout, and we meet him in the in the air. So, in other words, there, there is no mention of the church where us meeting then Jesus in heaven. Now, remember, John says, I look up in heaven, and there was an open door, and the voice said, Come up here. So if this is the rapture, which it is not. It couldn't be because, no, where is Jesus at? By the way, notice what John is saying right here. John is saying, I looked and there was a, uh, I looked up and there was an open door. So the, 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 the rapture is not ever pictured as the heavenly scene, but meeting the Lord in the air. Okay. Now, then he goes on and says, then the, the first voice that I heard speaking to me was like, was like a trumpet. So is this Jesus? Well, John doesn't say. Now, the trumpet could be because, yeah, Jesus shouts like a trumpet. All right. 
But these just come up here. But notice what he says. He, so, but the, the 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 it is clear he is ex he's talking to John. He has come up here. In, there's no indication this is the rapture. But he says, "Come up here, and I will show you what must take place after this." So, in other words, the revelation that John is going to receive, he's going to receive it from being in heaven. As Paul says, "Whether out of the body or in the spirit." I, by, whether in the body or out of the body, I cannot tell. So John is called up to heaven to receive the revelation. Now, even later in the book, he goes back and he, this, this, this prof, um, angel is going to tell him, you got to go back and prophesy to many, many people. Okay. So the only thing that this is saying right here is that um, he is, uh, in heaven. Secondly, there is no description that tells us what happens then, like the dead in Christ, right? Those who are coming with him, then the dead in Christ, we who are still alive, are caught up together with him to meet the Lord in the air. You see, you don't see any of that description here. In other words, this is John's experience as he is receiving the revelation from God to the people. All right, so now um, we skip down to chapter uh, six. Um, so remember, John is in heaven, okay? And what I want to skip down to is... Um, chapters, I'm, I'm gonna go to chapter seven. And uh, let's see. Now, one interesting thing is you see Jesus then, at this point, beginning, to me, the seven-year tribulation period, the judgment against the earth. So this is kind of what you see. Then I saw the lamb open the seventh seal. When he had opened the second seal, when he opened the third seal, when he had opened the fourth seal, when he opened the fifth seal. This is Jesus opening these seals and different things are happening uh, with each of these sets of judgments. So you see um, the seal judgment, they're going to um, unfold into the trumpet judgments, which are going to unfold into the bowl judgment. Okay. By the way, Jesus is the one who is um, afflicting. He is the one who is causing the judgments to come. Now, so when we come to chapter 7, let's look at the first group of people right here. And he says, after this, I saw the four angels standing on the four corners of the earth, restraining the four winds of the earth, so that no wind could blow on the earth or the sea or any tree. I saw another angel who had the seal of the living God rise up from the east. He cried out with a loud voice to the four angels who were empowered to harm the earth. And the sea. Now remember, this is since we got into past chapter three, in the chapter six, this is what's going on. The judgment is to harm the sea. Now remember, I asked a question. So at this point right here, it's God still building His holy sanctuary, because if the saints or the church here, that's what God is doing, right? So do we have these two things going on here, right? It's God building His sanctuary, the the, the 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 both Jew and Gentile, one body in in Christ. Is God still building that? Then He says, "Um." So He cried out with a loud voice for the four angels that were empowered to harm the earth and the sea. Don't harm the earth or the sea or the trees until, until we have sealed the slaves of our God on their forehead. Now, this word slave here could also I may be translated as servant. Slave, servant, it doesn't matter. <clears throat> One of the words that were used, especially by Paul, Peter, um, I'm, I, wonder, I, I think James, or Jude, um, 
is they would use the phrase bond slave. In their service to God, they would use the word bond slave. A bond slave was a person, a slave during, during this time, in, uh, especially during this time, a bond slave, a slave was a person who, even if they could go free, that they loved their master's soul, that they surrendered their wills to the will of their master. And they would say, I want to serve my master forever. And that's what they would do is a Jewish bond slave, they would take him before the elder, they would wring his nose, thus signifying he is surrendering his will to the will of his master, a bond slave. So the, the writers of the New Testament would use this same phrase when they said, I'm a bond slave to Jesus Christ. Now keep this in mind. That was their declaration. God's declaration of them that they were sons with his spirit crying, Abba, Father, heirs of God and joint heirs for Jesus Christ. So when he says here, however, don't harm the earth or the tree until we see the seal the slaves of our God on their forehead, then these were people that would call themselves bond slaves. But who are the slaves? Are they the church? Well, let's look. And then he says, and I heard the number of those that were sealed, 144,000 sealed from every tribe of the who? Israelites. So, the, so that's the whole thing. Right? It's the Israelites that this 144,000. By the way, those of you that follow, or sometimes you may have a Jehovah Witness knock on your door, their false teaching that the 144,000 were the upper class sons of God, Jehovah Witnesses, and then the rest were earthly. Again, you can see just from this, uh, and by the way, and no matter what, how they have been brainwashed, conditioned to not even acknowledge the plain reading of scripture right here. But I'm not going to, I'm not here to get into the Jehovah Witnesses. But notice here, 144,000 sealed from every tribe of Israel. So at this time, who is God dealing with? Israel. At this time, God is dealing with Israel, not the church. Is he building his holy sanctuary? No. He said, okay, first, let's seal the 144,000 Israelites, and then you can see 12,000 from each of the 12 tribes. And then look at verse 9. After this, I looked, and there was a vast multitude from every nation, tribe, people, language which no one could number, standing before the throne and before the Lamb. Uh, and they were robed in white with palm branches in their hands, and they cried with a loud voice. Now, some people see this, that the 144,000 were the evangelists that's going to be uh, going around preaching. But here's my point. The, 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 the text doesn't say that. What you see is 144,000 sealed, but then you see this uh, crowd afterwards, right? Could be coincidence, right? My point is, is that the text just not saying that. It says, after this, I look and there was a vast multitude. Now, <clears throat> he goes down, um, and then uh, in verse 13, then one of the elders asked, me now these are the 24 elders we didn't get into that get into who they are they are interesting group i didn't i didn't get into it but they they are 24 elders whoever they are we're not clear who they are but they're elders they are, they are identified as elders and 24 of them so then he said one of the elders asked me who are these people robed in white and where did they come from so watch it where did they come from now that's interesting isn't it Notice how what he's asking. Where did they come from? So now, is he going to say, well, these came out of, they started with Jesus building his church. Notice what he said. I said, for verse 14, I said to him, sir, you know. Then he told me, these are the ones coming out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the lamb. Now to stop. So, Remember, this group is coming out of the great tribulation. 
And remember in Matthew chapter 24, Jesus said, tribulation, there was going to be a time of great tribulation. So right here we see basically what Jesus was describing in 24, Matthew 24, about the abomination. When you see the abomination that caused desolation, flee to the mountain of Judah, uh, um, of Judea, Judea, right? So that's the Israelites. And now we see these great people, the crowd, that you cannot number coming out of great tribulation. This is where we are identifying. This is where this crowd is coming from. And notice too, that it is not identified that they are the result of witnessing. Now, no doubt, by the way, someone is going to witness with them. At some point, they're coming to Christ. Okay, but watch this. So verse 15, for this reason, they are before the throne of God and they serve him day and night in his sanctuary. And the one seated on the throne will shout to them, they will no longer hunger, they will no longer thirst, the sun will no longer strike them. By the way, if you're reading some of the stuff that's going on in the tribulation period, there's going to be some heat stroke going on as part of the judgment, this increased heat. Anyway, he says, no over any heat. Verse 17, the lamb who is in this, the lamb who is at the center of the throne will shepherd them. He will guide them to springs of living water and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. So this the sorrow or whatever, right? Notice he said the lamb will shepherd them. So notice what's not being described with these, this group of people, that they are sons of God, that holy temple that God was building, the heirs of God. Okay. So then we go down with some more uh, judgments. And then we're going to come to uh, uh, very fascinating book here. Let me find. Oh, look at this. Verse 11. Um, now, now, now watch the language. Verse 11. Then I was given a measuring reed like a rod. With these words, go and measure God's sanctuary and the altar and count those who worship there. Hmm. But watch this. But, exclu but exclude the courtyard outside the sanctuary. Don't measure it because it is given to the nations. Now, in other translations, it would say Gentiles. And they will trample the holy city for 42 months. And now, okay, so now we're not going to go into that, but understand here, again, the holy city. Who is the holy city? Jerusalem. So what is he talking about? Jerusalem. And then he says, and I will empower my two witnesses, and they will prophesy for 1,260 days. So now 42 months, 1,260 days. Put it like this. We're talking around three and a half years, Okay. Then he says, dressed in sackcloth. And then he says, these are the two olive trees, the two left stand that stand before the Lord of the earth. Okay. And uh, let me show you something right quick. Uh huh. Zechariah 4. Just so we can know where we're getting. Zechariah. Chapter four. All right, so look at chapter four, and he says, um, the angel, he says, the angel who was speaking with me returned and aroused me as one awakened out of sleep. Now, understand this too, the, 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 the Zachariah, to me, it's the Old Testament version of the book of Revelation. This book has so much revelation in it that compares with the book of Revelation. Now watch this though. He says, um, he asked me, what do you see? He says, I replied, I see a solid gold lampstand and there was a bowl, with, uh, bowl on its top and it has seven lamps on it and seven channels for each of the lamps on its tops. There's also two olive 
trees beside it, one on the right of the bow and the other on the left. And then I asked the angel who was speaking with me, what are these, my lords? Do you not know uh, what they are? Replied the angel who was speaking with me. I said, no, my lord. So he answered, this is the word of the Lord to Jerubbabel, uh, uh, not by strength, not by mind, but by my spirit, saith the Lord. Then he says, what are you, great mountain, before the Jerubbabel? The, the I'm going to skip down because this is a prophecy about those, uh, I'm going to pick up verse 11, about those uh, who, who returned to the land after the exile. So verse 11 says, I asked them, what are the two olive trees on the right and the left of the lampstand? And I questioned him further, uh, what are the two olive branches besides the two gold conduit from which the golden oil pours out? And then he says, then he required me, do you not know what these are? No, <laughs> my Lord. I replied, these are the two anointed ones. Uh, uh, he said, who stand uh, by the Lord of the whole earth. Now, I just want you to see that these are the two anointed ones. So when we see this here, uh, um, in verse 11, um, he says, I will empower my two witnesses, and they will prophesy 1260 days dressed in sackcloth. These are the two olive trees uh, and the two lampstands that stand before the Lord of the earth. So we saw that in, in, in the book of Zechariah. All right, so it goes on. Um, it talks about how they will really torment those ungodly men, the, the beasts and everybody else, and then they will actually die. And um, um, I, I, I'll read it because this is kind of amazing here. It says, verse 7, when they finish their testimony, the beast that comes up out of the abyss will make war with them, conquer them, and kill them. The dead bodies will lie in the public square of the great city, which prophetically is called Sodom and Egypt, where also the Lord was crucified. So again, talking about how wicked Jerusalem will be at this time. Verse 9, and the representatives from the people's tribe, language, and nations will view their bodies for three and a half days and not permit their bodies to be put into the tombs. Those who live on the earth will gloat over them and celebrate and send gifts to one another because these two prophets brought judgment to those who live on the earth. So they have, this is a very amazing um, prophecy. And then, but after verse 11, but after uh, three and a half days, the breath of life from God entered them and they stood on their feet. So great fear fell on those who saw them. Then they heard a loud voice from heaven saying to them, come up here. And they went up to heaven in the cloud while the enemies watch them. So that was, again, amazing. Imagine you dancing and oh, rejoicing to know these dead bodies and they come to life. And notice he said, then they said, come up here and they go up. Now, I want to read one more. Uh, let's go to chapter 20 because people quote chapter 20 a lot. So, um, and, and these are groups, again, that are specifically identified as saints, okay? Um, hmm, should I do? Uh, da, da, da. I, I'm, I, I, I would read chapter 19, but I'm not at this time. It talks about the, uh, the marriage of the lamb, but in chapter 20, uh, in verse 4, it says, Then I saw thrones, and the people seated on them who were given authority to judge. I also saw the people who had been beheaded because of the testimony about Jesus and because of God's word, and who had not worshipped the beast or his image and had not accepted the mark on their foreheads, uh, on their hands. They came to life and reigned with the Messiah for a thousand years. The rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years were complete. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is the one who shares in the first resurrection. The second death has no power over them. 
But look at this. But they will be priests of God and the Messiah, and they will reign with him for a thousand years. Now, notice again, is this talking about the body of Christ? The answer is no. But notice this. He says, who are the people? Notice he said they were beheaded because of the testimony about Jesus. They came to life and reign. This is the first resurrection. So my, here's my point. When he talks about the first resurrection, this first resurrection, and he notice the first resurrection, this is the period of time in the group of people that he is referring to. Now, again, this is why I say details are important because some people automatically apply this to the church, some even the rapture. Some even say that this is when the rapture actually happens. But no, notice, none of this says this at all. Now, I'm not, so again, let's just stick with what the scripture says. Who is this group of people that's a part of this first resurrection? Those that would be headed because of their testimony. So doing a particular period of time. All right. <clears throat> so that's, when, when we talk about the saints then, in the book of, uh, of Revelation, remember we are not talking about in the church that God is building for his inhabitation. That is the difference. But God is talking about the church that's being built for his habitation. All right, guys, look, um, we're not through. We're going to continue on our study. But I wanted to talk about, again, we got to identify who these saints are. So, okay. So anyway, that is uh, um, uh, my perspective. Don't forget to like and share this video and subscribe to BP, The Bible Perspective. And as always, if you have a thought or comment, add it to the comment section below. All comments are welcome. Now, again, let me just say this. All comments are welcome. I don't delete comments ever. I don't care if you disagree with me, even if you get belligerent. Uh, insult me, I don't delete them, okay? So if they're getting deleted, I, I cannot explain that. I don't know. I'm not deleting them ever, ever. I'll just ignore you if you're belligerent. That's the first thing. You you know when I'm ignoring you because I'll simply say, thank you for your comment. God bless you. But if you want to have an intelligent conversation, I'm game for that. If you want to challenge my thought, I'm game for that. Let me also say this, though. Look at the video. Most of the times I see comments where people obviously want to just give their view and they're not responding to what I put forth. That's not an intelligent conversation. You just want to take up space to kind of voice your own opinion. No. Look at the video and then challenge what I say. All right, guys. Um, uh, I did say it, right? Don't forget to like and share this video and subscribe to BP, the Bible Perspective. But as always, if you have a thought or comment, add it to the comment section below. All comments are welcome, and I do mean that. All right, I'll see you in the next video.